Has everyone had a good conference so far? Yeah? This, this is actually my first Resonate, and I've really enjoyed it. Um, so I do want to thank Jeff and all of the other speakers for being here. I've learned quite a bit, and I've really enjoyed the company of all of you. Um, I had a blast last night getting to know a lot of you and understand what you're doing with your business on Amazon, off Amazon. Um, and I'm really excited for this next presentation. This is actually one I didn't want to miss because it's an area where I feel like I'm definitely not an expert. I have a lot to learn. Um, so I'm really excited to introduce our next speaker, Eddie Levine. He is the president of HubDub LTD. He carries 15 years of e-commerce experience. His company helps mid-tier and larger size brands successfully navigate over 30 marketplaces worldwide. I'm sure that's an area where a lot of you have struggled. And based on a wide variety of products and channels served, Eddie's logistical experience is second to none in the industry. And his company helps save tens of thousands of dollars to sellers just like yourselves. So give him a warm round of applause, Eddie Levine. Thank you so much. So as I was trying to figure out what I would use as my bio introductory slide, this is what I came up with. So hi. <laughs> this is about as much effort as I put into this because every time I write a bio, it just doesn't flow right. So I just figured I would do this. And then I figured, what can I follow it up with that would make sense for this presentation? So I chose this. <laughs> right? Because that just makes it all come full circle. So I do love logistics. It's a topic that most people don't like and don't understand and don't want to understand, and it's something that just came naturally to me. I didn't really take any class on it or, or get any instruction from anybody on it when I was get, learning the ropes myself. So um, it's something that I've just kind of embraced and, and have shared my knowledge with anyone who has asked me about that, anything re re regarding the logistics topic. But um, you know, obviously my logistics experience is mostly geared towards my selling side and my warehousing experience. That picture up there is, happens to be the expansion we did for our warehouse last September. And uh, it's not just the logistics side of the business that I know. It's logistics for everything in my life, I feel like, that I'm an expert in. So uh, this next example that I'm going to give you is something that I just happened to have happened to me, or hap uh, just happened to me a few days ago as I was flying back to Atlanta from China. And it was an argument that my girlfriend and I had because, well, the baggage came out of the carousel and um, that's what I did with the baggage. We had five bags, and she argued with, argued with me, saying, we, we need two carts. There's no way it's going to fit on one cart. And I said, no, you're wrong, because what you're doing is you're stacking the, the luggage incorrectly. You're putting the biggest bags in the bottom, and then you're you know, making the small ones go on top, and that's how it's going to fall over. So I, I was so proud of the fact that I put one small bag on the bottom, and then it kind of made a base layer. It's, it's dumb, but you know, I get excited about this. So just let me have my moment. Uh, um, I also have this example, just for, for, this is for Jeff. So when I fly, Jeff knows this, um, I, I choose the, the path of most resistance normally. And uh, so when I fly, like for example, to, from Chicago to California, I have wanna go to uh, Ontario. So the, my options are I can make two connections and go to Ontario, or I can make a nonstop to LA. So you know, which one do you choose, of course, you would do the, do the two connections, that makes much more sense. And you know what, I do that because logistically, when you fly six months a year, and you're always in the air, and you're just spending your life on an airplane, more miles and more segments are good, so this pays off. That's why I do that. Jeff kind of stole my thunder earlier, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna use this as another example, but Uber is apparently gonna strike today, so if you didn't hear that earlier, um, and you're flying out tonight, and you need a ride to the airport, you might wanna double check the app before you leave here and make sure that uh, it's not gonna cost you a fortune. But that's kind of a, a little logistics background for you. Um, you can do the Marta too, yeah. Or, 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 or you could do a bird, a scooters. I've done that in the last two days, I love that. I mean, you can, I'm just saying. <laughs> it might be hard. <laughs> Logistically, you can. A uh, little bit of my, about my company, HubDub. We were established in 2012. We help mid-tier and larger size brands, um, normally brands that are doing, doing or have the potential to do at least 500,000 to a million dollars in sales per year on the platform. That's who we target for our, for our business. And uh, we do sell on 30 different channels worldwide. So we're obviously on the, the Amazon international channels, but also Walmart, Jet, Groupon, 
Rakuten, Sears, all those channels that you've heard before, we operate on them on a daily basis. And uh, we are strategically located in the Chicago region, not, not specifically just because I grew up there, but it happen, happens to work really well for our business because we're on so many different channels that, uh, you know, that, that, mid set, that middle placement in the country works really well for us to get products to wherever distribution center we need them to go in a quick amount of time. So logistics, when you hear, when you hear about this topic, it is everywhere. Um, so the four points that I'm gonna cover with you today that are relevant for this business are uh, when you get products from overseas, when you're bringing them in for, from your factories in China, where you're doing private label, but also when you have them in the country and domestically, how you're getting them to either Amazon or to your customers if you're doing fulfillment by merchant, seller fulfilled prime, uh, any specific model you're doing, that's all gonna be covered on, on our domestic area as well. I'm also gonna talk about when I compare the fulfillment options, if you're doing you know, FBA versus FBM, I have a, a, an example here of a product that I helped another seller with last week. Um, he was trying to figure out how he was gonna make a profit on this product, if he could do FBA or if he had to do FBM and what his options are. So I'll talk you through a little bit about that. And then last but not least, we'll talk about a little bit more about the warehousing selection and configuration for those of you who either have a warehouse yourself or are looking to move into a warehouse set up for your business in the near future. So starting with sourcing overseas, let's talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly. Here are my recommendations for you if you are, if this is, plays into your business model today. I tell people, in my personal opinion, I avoid air freight whenever possible unless you are sourcing very, very small products that you wouldn't normally put on a container that fit into a box because they're such a small unit that it makes sense. I avoid air freight because it's extremely expensive and I also avoid, if I'm not doing air freight, avoid trying to do containers that are less than a full container load, a partial, or are a 20 foot container. The reason I avoid this is because a normal size container is 40 feet, and a 20 foot container being half the size is not necessarily ever uh, half the cost. It's more like 80% of the cost, 70% of the cost. So you're not saving yourself, doing yourself any favors by shrinking your order quantity down and using a 20 foot container. There are alternatives um, if you don't have enough inventory to fill a 40 foot container rather than use a smaller one and pay that premium price. Um, when you are doing a smaller amount of quantity from overseas, think about consolidation options yourself. And what I mean by that, get to know the other sellers who are in the space, who are shipping from uh, the same port in China who are, you know, who are kind of on your same schedule or um, in your same kind of business model. If you are shipping from China and you're picking up from FOB, uh, FOB Ningbo, for example, you're both sailing out of there and you find another seller who is doing the same thing, their factory is shipping right from Ningbo, China, see when their sailing schedule is, figure out if you can combine and consolidate your shipments onto one container to save yourselves both money because if you have 20 feet of space and they have 20 feet of space and you get a 40 foot container, both of you are gonna save so much money when it comes to logistics and bringing it overseas into the country. I do this with sellers who I know for my products when I don't have enough quantity to fill one container in a particular shipment and it works out really well for the both of us, but you have to take the initiative to find other people in a network with other people and figure out who those people are so you can both benefit from that, uh, that monetary savings. You also have to factor in transit time and customs issues when you're importing products from overseas. What I mean by this is specifically related to forecasting and um, figuring out you know, when, when you're gonna have to replace uh, place, place new orders and make sure that you're not gonna run out of stock because if you're ordering from overseas, not only is there production time, but there's time to get the, there's time to get the shipment from the factory and from the shipping dock all the way over to the, this country and then to your location. You're looking anywhere from three weeks to six weeks, depending on the traffic. And if your shipment gets held up by customs for any reason, doesn't matter what it is, that could be another few weeks, if not more, by the time they clear it, if they clear it to you, uh, once they've gone through their entire process. You need to account, um, account for that time as well. Properly research your freight brokers. I cannot stress this one to you enough, there are oodles and oodles of freight brokers in the marketplace today who claim they can help you with anything you possibly need on freight. I have learned that a lot of them have no idea what they're doing and it ends up costing you a lot of money. 
because if they fill out their paperwork incorrectly, if they don't know how to use the right HTS code for the products that you're importing, if they don't know how to declare it to customs, it's gonna cost you money, it's gonna flag your container, it's gonna cost you inspection charges and lost revenue and lost time. Um, there is a very good resource in this room right now. Dale, can you raise your hand? That's Dale Lenz. If any of you have interacted with him on Facebook, he's quite active on a lot of the communities. He's an awesome resource uh, for freight and is a freight broker himself. Um, I'm really glad he was able to stop by today because I have not had a chance to meet him and he's a, a great resource and if you wanna talk to him, definitely is worth your time. So let's talk about a specific example for analyzing cost for getting shipping done for a product that you're looking to import from overseas. Let's just assume that this product, this Cuisinart knife set was your private label product, right? This is the one you're gonna import into the country. You need to figure out the best way to do it. So, this product, you have, I'm giving you basically three options here. Do you wanna import the top line 400 units, 800 units on the middle line, or 1600 units on the bottom line? Top is two months supply, the middle is four months supply, and the bottom is an eight month supply. As you can see, the unit cost and the extended cost, regardless of how many you order, that's irrelevant because it's gonna be just depending on how many units you order, there's no savings there. Unless, of course, your vendor is gonna give you a price break for the more quantity, then that's something to look into. But for this specific example, I'm not gonna use that as a, as a, as a, as a uh, part of this equation. So what does matter, though, is the FOB shipping cost. You'll notice on a two month supply of this particular product, to bring that into the country, it's a cost of $2,160. But if I jump up to four month, I only increase my shipping cost by about $300. And if I bring in eight months supply, I'm going up to 3,000. So what you'll notice here is if you bring in two months supply, that's fine, but in two months, you're gonna have to order it again and you'll spend 4,800 you know, in, in, um, in, two in uh, four months worth of inventory when you could have ordered that same amount of quantity right from the start and paid 2,400 in total. So you'll want to think about when you're projecting out how much you need for inventory for sales wise, think about how much money you're gonna be saving in shipping if you order a little bit more than you would normally order just based on sheer velocity of sales. Um, and also, think, look, at, look at that last column on the right. Look how that impacts your price per unit, uh, sorry, your shipping cost per unit when you factor in how much savings that shipping is. If I order the smallest amount of quantity, those 400 units, my shipping cost per unit, uh, if I divide that uh, 400 units by the, by the cost, is $5.40 per unit. That's a hefty price point to pay when I could be paying $1.88 if I just ordered a lot more quantity. That's, that, that savings is very, very significant. Taking it a step further, I just moved that same um, image up to the top. So I'm now looking at that mill image right there. But if I look at it from a warehousing perspective of, of how much it's gonna cost me to warehouse it in my location and also how much I'm gonna pay FBA fees to have that stored at Amazon, let's look at this left column for a second first. If I'm only bringing in two months supply, that's the, the column that says none up there, Obviously, I'm not gonna have a warehousing cost because in theory, if I'm bringing in two months of supply, it's gonna go directly to Amazon, it's gonna sit on their shelves. Nothing's in my warehouse, right? So that's when you see the FBA storage cost of $336 because basically what I've done is I've taken the 84 cent number, which is how much it costs per month to store that specific ASIN at Amazon, and I've multiplied that by 400 because I'm thinking it's two months supply, I have, um, 400, I have 400 units, two months supply, sorry, multiplied by 800. 400 units um, multiplied by two, that gets me that 336 number. Now, if I look at the second line and I say, well, I'm gonna, I assume I brought in four months supply of that inventory or 800 units in total, so I'm gonna assume to myself, well, I am gonna bring it on to my warehouse except for I'm gonna uh, send in five skids per month to Amazon's facility to be sold, right? If I, if I had ordered that four month supply, the 800 units, I equated that to 20 skids worth of inventory. So when I say I'm going to warehouse uh, everything except five skids, that means 15 of those skids are gonna be sitting in the warehouse being stored. And for, uh, for calculation purposes, 
I figured I'm gonna be paying about $15 per skid per month to be warehoused. And that's kind of the going rate if you don't have a warehouse yourself. If you go to find a 3PL, you're gonna be paying about 10 to $15 per month per skid for them just to sit on your product and hold it at their facility. So that's kind of what that equates to. That's $750. Um, if, you, if you multiply that out, uh, the, the, the uh, 15 skids that are being, gonna be stored there per month with five skids being moved out you know, uh, month after month. So like month two, it's gonna be at, uh, it's gonna be at um, 15 skids, month three, 10 skids, month four, five skids, and then you're gonna be sold out of inventory. And uh, same kind of calculation for the FBA storage. You're taking your monthly um, storage cost of 42 cents times the number of units they have on hand at the FBA warehouse. That's your monthly storage cost for the product itself. So um, what you'll see here again is that the even though that the warehousing cost and the uh, FBA storage cost do get um, more and more expensive as you bring in more products, you'll see here at the end, if I total up these numbers, and I look at it and I go, well, if I order that same two month supply, those 400 units, that first line, my total per unit buy cost, if I factor in my shipping to the US, if I factor in my cost to warehouse it at my facility or at a 3PL, and if I factor in the cost to warehouse it at Amazon and FBA, is $12.24 per unit. Remember, I started at $6 was my, was my raw cost, right? If I brought in a four month supply or 800 units, my cost per unit drops to 1036. That's a significant savings. And if I had brought an eight month supply on a 40 foot container, I get my cost down to 999. Take a look at the totals that are listed on the column on all the way on the right side. Two, uh, 400 units, two months supply would cost me just under $5,000. If I ordered eight months, that total cost is only 15,984. If you do simple math here, if I, had, if I order the smallest quantity of 400 units, but I do that four times to equate to that bottom level, I would have spent almost 20,000. So I'm saving almost 25% of my cost by ordering more of that upfront. Because if I do that 48.96 times four, way more than that 15.984 number. That's kind of how I, how I calculate those for you there. Now, domestic logistics, that's a whole different animal. And it's one that I think is also important to know because everyone at some point or another is gonna get their products delivered to the states here and they're gonna have to figure out how do I get it either to Amazon or how do I get my products to the customer's hands. It's gonna cost money one way or shape or one way or another, and we all wanna save as much money as possible. So let's talk about um, you know, whether you not you use small parcel UPS to Amazon, if you use LTL, you know, a few pallets at a time, or if you do full truckload, it doesn't matter. All these are there are options that cost you money, and there's ways to save money by utilizing each of these services. The the common um, the common theme here is that everyone thinks, well, Amazon gives partner carrier rates for UPS shipping and also for uh, less than truckload and truckload into their facilities, but, and their rates are untouchable, right? The, you, you might as well use the Amazon partner carriers because their rates are just, no one can touch them and you'll never find anyone cheaper. But I can tell you right now, that's not true. I've beat their rates multiple times on shipments that I've sent in their facility. It happens almost every day to sellers in the community who know how to properly set up their shipments. Consolidation is your friend. Again, I stressed this when I was talking about the uh, bringing in products from overseas. That consolidation can save you a lot of money. It can save you a lot of money domestically as well, and I'll show you exactly what I mean by that. Who here has sent in products to the Amazon facility, particularly at Q4, and they have waited weeks to get it received? Yeah, everybody, right? There is a way to ship into Amazon and get it into their facility and receiving the same day. Anyone wanna know how to do that? Mm, yeah, I'll tell you, it's great. It, it was really good in Q4 last year. Um, so this last question I have on this slide basically, who here has done a ride share with Uber before? Uber or Lyft? You all know who that is, right? Who here has heard of Uber Freight? Who here has not heard of them? Most of you, right. That exists, believe it or not, and for the last, I would say about eight months or so, that's pretty much who I've used exclusively to get my products into the Amazon Fulfillment Network. And it happens really quickly. 
So let me talk to, me, talk to you a little bit more about that. So let's do a domestic cost analysis on shipping for the exact same item that we just did internationally. Let's assume that I wanted to send in 800 units. I bought, you know, I, I took that, that initial leap and I did the smallest quantity purchase I could do. I bought 800 units of that, of that, of that knife set. Now I want to send them all into Amazon, right? You know, it sells really well. I don't want to warehouse them. I just want to send them into Amazon and be done with them. Here's my first option. I can send them by UPS and I could put a label on every single case and just send them in. And we all know how to do that, right? That, that's been around for a, while, for a long time. So I put in my configuration. I just happen to put in my, uh, the configuration on for UPS maxes out at uh, 200 boxes. So I had to kind of get creative and say it was a case of four, but it really isn't. But it'll work for this presentation. Um, so I said, you know, I've got 200 boxes, case packed four, 800 units. I'm going to send them UPS. They're going to say, great, no problem. It's going to cost you $1,600 to send that in. That is expensive. It's so expensive that it costs 20 cents per pound to send that into Amazon. And it also costs you $2 and one penny per unit on top of your cost that you've already had to bring it into the country and buy it from your supplier. That's an extreme excess amount of uh, you know, additional fee that you might not have been expecting. So you say, what's a better way to do this? Well, there's a couple ways. Here's one better way. Send it by pallets, less than truckload, right? Or full truckload, if depending on how much inventory you have. And if you do this, I say, I, I tell the system, I said, hey, I've got those same 800 units, and I'm going to put them on 20 skids, just for simplicity's sake. I'm, I'm going to pretty much fill that truck. I mean, a, a full truck is anywhere between 26 and 30 skids, but for this particular example, I'm going to say, I just have 20. And, uh, you know, same kind of weight, same item. They're going to say, great, that now costs $546 to send into Amazon's fulfillment network. That brings your cost per pound down to 6.8 cents or 68 cents per unit. Significant improvement, right? What's the problem with LTL shipping? Takes forever, right? Yeah, so a lot of people say, you know what, it's just not worth it because especially during Q4, if I wait three weeks, four weeks, it could blow my whole season, it's not worth it, I'll just pay the extra and be done with it, right? I would have agreed with you up until about October last year when it all changed because the Uber Freight Network started and it was an absolute lifesaver. If you are not familiar with Uber Freight and you've not registered on their portal, I will show you right here exactly what it looks like. It is a pretty user-friendly portal and you can set up a full truckload shipment in about 30 seconds. The good thing about Uber Freight is you don't need to be sending in full truckloads at a time. Uber Freight is gonna give you a cost for the truck and if you put a single skid in that truck, they're gonna say, great, we'll take it to Amazon for you. It doesn't matter if you fill the truck. You're paying for the truck, but you don't have to fill it up. That's the common misconception. They, people say, well, I don't have a full truck. I'm, I'm not gonna, it's gonna be a waste of space. It's gonna waste of money. Not so much because if I put that in there for Uber Freight and I say, hey, pick it up for me, drop it off at Amazon, great. That truck has cost you $320. That brings your cost down to four cents per pound for that inventory or 40 cents per unit, right? Here's the other kicker about Uber Freight. Uber Freight is not an Amazon partner carrier, but you can have Uber Freight request appointments at the Amazon facility for you, and because they're a dedicated carrier with a full truckload, as opposed to less than truckload with a common carrier, they have priority when it comes to uh, getting unloaded. They're not waiting days in and days out to get unloaded at the facility. If they pick up from me, you know, let's just say Friday, for example, they have an appointment at Amazon that night, most likely. And they're gonna be delivering it to Amazon, and Amazon's gonna be receiving that load, and they're gonna be unloading it and receiving it, most likely, by the time I wake up the next morning. And that inventory is most likely already hit my, my account as uh, almost getting ready for sale. The kicker with the Uber Freight Network is, you can bring this cost down even more by using consolidation. I mentioned that to you with overseas stuff. With Uber Freight, this is what I do for a lot of the sellers in the Chicago region for myself is when I have, let's say I have 15 skids going out on my Uber Freight truck, I've got room for another 15 more if I wanted to really max out that, that space on that trailer. I'll call other sellers in my area and say, hey, do you have any pallets going to MDW2 that you can send out right now? And I'll cross stock at my facility if I have to, or I'll have the Uber truck 
make a couple stops if, I, if it makes more sense, and pick up multiple seller shipments. Because if you think about it, when an LTL truck, when a common carrier goes to Amazon, they don't have just your inventory on that trailer. It has multiple sellers inventory. You can do that with Uber Freight. So remember, that truck's only costing $320. If four, three or four sellers are splitting the cost of that truck, you can bring your cost down next to nothing. And all of your inventory is getting in that much faster. Now, people say, I just want to sell, um, but I also need to make a profit. And a lot of sellers don't realize that they're not making as much as they think they are. So this, uh, this a seller that I know quite well in the industry came to me last week and he said, can you help me understand my costs for um, this product that I'm thinking of bringing in from overseas? I want to see if it would make sense to sell it, if I, if, if it, how I would ship it to my customers. What's your take on it, right? And so I said, no problem. Let me, let me figure out what it looks like for you. And I basically did a case study on, does it make sense to do it FBA? Does it make sense to do FBM? What is it, you know, what's the best option for you here? Um, and what happened is this. He said, I found a great product. Fulfillment can't be that much, can it? I said, well, let's take a look. And because I, don't, because I know the seller well and it's, it's, a, it's a hot item, I think, going to be for him, we're going to call this item the mystery item, the mystery box. The mystery box fact check. This item weighs 115 pounds. It is 39 inches by 65 inches by 13 inches. It's a big unit, right? The sell price is $500 on Amazon. The cost of his product from China is $155. So you're looking at that and going, wow, that's a hefty profit margin. There's no way he can not make money on that, right? Mm, yeah, <laughs> it's a big item, so let's, let's see. So he asked me this question at the bottom. He said, what's my cost to fulfill this, merchant fulfilled, if I wanted to fulfill it from New York to LA? He's going the worst case scenario, right? Because he's in New York. He said, if I got a merchant fulfilled and I've got to go to LA, what's my worst case scenario? And that's fine, you can look at it that way because you know it's not gonna be more than that, right? So I said, all right, let me, let me take a look at it for you. And um, here's, what, here's what I ended up finding out. The, Picture on the left is what came back from UPS. Too big, they won't take it. Not only too big, it's too big by four inches. Bad product, right? So I come back to him and I say, you got a problem. I said, uh, you, this is too big to ship to UPS, they won't even accept the package. So never mind it being expensive, they just won't take it. Second one, he said, well what about if I send it on a less than truckload trailer because they, they take freight, I could just palletize it and they can just pick it up and whatever. I said, you know, that works, but you're going to consumer. You're trying to do FBM to consumer. You're not sending to Amazon's uh, facility. So those freight trucks are gonna, are gonna charge you for an appointment. They're gonna charge you for a residential delivery. They're gonna charge you for a lift gate. That cost to ship that one unit is gonna be a lot more expensive than you think. It's gonna be hundreds of dollars. That's picture number two. Picture three. I ran the fee calculation for FBA on this product. Kind of an eyesore to read, but at a $500 sell price, Amazon's gonna take away from that $500 sell price $253 based on that size item. <laughs> Youch. His cost is $155, leaving him with the total profit to deal with that item of $16. <laughs> that doesn't work. No, not when you're paying to get that from China. That does not work. You will lose a lot of money on that. So I told him, you've got a problem because this is not profitable. And he couldn't believe it. So I said, here's your solutions. You have a couple options. I said, you can resize that box, change the configuration, and get it down four inches so that you can actually ship it in UPS. That's one option. That's probably your best option. I said, the other option is, instead of shipping it from New York, warehouse them with someone in the Midwest. Me. <laughs> or anyone, uh, but I said, you know, if you ship it from someone in the Midwest, somewhere in the Midwest, chances are you're closer to a lot more of your buyers, right? And I did the calculation for him and I said, look, if you can save an average, and this, this is what it ended up being, if you can save an average of um, $30 per shipment and you have, you know, a couple hundred of these units, four, 400, four, 400 units I think it was, I said, you are going to save about $10,000 by the time you sold all these units. It's a big number. He said, so is it really worth you trucking this or, and freighting this all the way from China all the way to the East Coast 
when it makes more sense for you to warehouse this in the middle of the country? So he said, no, I never thought about that. The other option I gave him, I said, hey, you know, if this item can be changed packaging wise, see if you can ship it in two different boxes that are smaller boxes. You know, that way you can get within the UPS size limitations and um, you can actually ship it that way and save money. So those are the options that I gave him. Now, um, when you look at something like Seller Fulfilled Prime, it's a little bit different, but you should consider Seller Fulfilled Prime in this program for your larger items or your slower movers, the ones that for FBA doesn't make much sense because either the fees or because you're just, you can't, you know, it doesn't make sense to have that kind of inventory sitting in the shelf for that long. Um, if you don't have a warehouse for this to do, to do a Seller Fulfilled Prime, it's not a problem because you can use a 3PL and um, Jeff actually brought this up to me last week and he said, have you heard of a company called Shipbox? Shipbob, sorry, Shipbob. And I said, you know what, I haven't really heard of them, but let me look into it. And I did look into it. And this happens to be a 3PL that is so well versed in Amazon, they basically have a pricing model in play for any Amazon seller who wants to use their services basically like an FBA warehouse. So they're basically offering their services and they're competing with Amazon's pricing. So if you want an option to do Seller Fulfilled Prime or to just potentially have your products outside of the FBA warehouse but still have Seller Fulfilled Prime or Prime badge, look into that, look, look into that um, option for your business as well. Um, make sure you ensure the, the capabilities of your 3PL, especially if you're doing something like Seller Fulfilled Prime, make sure that your 3PL can actually commit to the time frame and the volume that, they, that you're gonna have for them. Because if you need to ship them, if you need to have them ship within a day or two, and they say, you know, our typical turnaround time is three or four days, that's not gonna work for you. Make sure you talk to them about this stuff before you uh, sign a contract with them and actually send your product into their warehouse. Also, leverage a 3PL that has multiple locations across the country. If you go to a 3PL and they only have one location in California or one location on the East Coast or one location in the Midwest, it's not gonna do you much good, especially if you're doing Seller Fulfilled Prime, you want them to have multiple locations just like Amazon does so that you have a slower, or you have a faster turnaround time to the customer at a lower cost. So consider that as well. Small and light, that's another program. Um, for those of you who don't use small and light, there's pros and cons to that program, but it's good to know about it as well. Um, products that are, I think it's like 16 by 11 by four, if I'm remembering the direct dimensions right, and under 15 ounces, I think it is, um, can go into this program. The, the pros in this program are, are the FBA fulfillment fees are significantly less than traditional FBA, sometimes up to half off. And uh, there's no minimum spend re requirement from the buyer. So if this item is really cheap, a four or $5 item, they can buy this through the small and light program and they can just buy that one single unit and not have to tack it onto an additional order. There's no such thing as a, um, you know, an add-on item for small and light. Cons, um, if, you're a, uh, if you're a seller who relies on Amazon to do prep for you, labeling, bagging, and any of that stuff, they will not do it for small and light items. Um, it does ship to small and light fulfillment centers. So if you're used to sending to one fulfillment center nearby your, to your location for all your items that you have, your small and light items will mo most likely not go to that same location. That will increase your logistics costs. So consider that when you're doing small and light. Also from the buyer perspective, it is a four to five day prime delivery as opposed to a prime two day delivery for small and light items. Last but not least, I wanna cover in this presentation is about warehousing. Who here has a warehouse already? Who here is in the next year thinking, yeah, I might get that, I might get that point? Who here just doesn't wanna do it at all, ever? Okay, we got a diverse crowd. All right, so um, the stuff you didn't think about, you know, everyone I talked about the warehousing side of the equation, they think they know what they should ask about a warehouse and what they how they should operate a warehouse, and I usually can uncover a few things that they didn't think about when I look at a lease or when I look at their configuration or when I look at their uh, operation, there's things that I, I would have noticed when I walked in that building, but they didn't happen to see. So um, I'm gonna walk you through a couple of those right now. So it's a warehouse, not a retail store. People get obsessed with how it looks. Who cares? Literally, it's a concrete slab with dust. It doesn't matter how it looks. So don't get tied up with how the warehouse looks, how pretty it is, it's not a retail store. But even though it doesn't look pretty, you wanna do a, what I call, site survey. This is an aerial view of the warehouse that I have. My building is the one on top. And you wanna do a site survey mainly for your traffic flow. Um, your traffic flow in the warehouse 
is important because if you look at my facility, the trucks would normally come in and they would pull up on the street here and they'd normally pull in right here, come around this building, come all the way around to my dock right in the back there, right? Well, the problem is in the winter time, the snow plows like to pile all the snow right here. So that doesn't work. And they also like to pile it right here. So that doesn't work. Um, and also, the genius landlords that I have make parking spaces right here. So my neighbors like to park their cars there, which makes it impossible to get a truck around the building. So these things are things that you want to think about when you're looking at a warehouse and when you're looking to move or upsize or anything in your business, right? Um, even, even for a truck that would come in through here and potentially pull in here, you know, if he does that, he's got to come in this way, back up. It's kind of hard visual because it's at an angle. These are, area, these are obstructions that you should be looking out for in your warehouse that if you sign a lease and then you know, it can't be accessed by a, by a delivery company, you might have a problem and then you can't get out of your lease. You know, and the landlord's gonna say, well, wasn't my fault because you signed off on it. You, you saw the property, right? Um, also check the, the dock specifically. A lot of warehouses that I've seen and that I've looked at for my own personal use over the last few years, the dock is not regular truck dock height. Uh, a, a truck dock height, a, um, a normal truck height dock is 48 inches high, and I have seen docks as low as 32, you know, 40. And when you're trying to move pallets that weigh two or 3,000 pounds up or down eight inches, it doesn't work. <laughs> um, also, check, about check on your neighbors and weather issues. So what I mean by that is if you have neighbors who are Every morning they have all their delivery trucks, you know, loading up and ready to go and starting their routes for whatever business they're in. If they're blocking your access for the first three hours of the day every morning, you're gonna wanna know about that. That's, that's impacting your business, right? So things that you might not see by visiting the facility one time, you'll wanna go on a couple different occasions at different times of the day and figure out what possible issues you have at that facility. Inside the building, you wanna target Area, uh, um, warehouses that are square or rectangle, just like the one in the background here. Don't target warehouses that are really low ceilings or they zigzag because from a storage perspective, if they zigzag or they're on angles, you're gonna be able to store a lot less product. And from a height perspective, you are paying for the square footage of the floor, not the height. So my warehouse, I have 23 foot ceilings. I can triple stack the inventory on those racks. It, saves me a lot of money because I can use that airspace that I'm not paying rent for. I highly encourage you to get industrial grade racking. I personally prefer new racking and my reasoning for this is because used racking, while it might do the job, a lot of times damages on used racking you cannot see. Um, there's, there's twists and turns that are so minimal that you can't see from just the naked eye but it really impacts the structural um, efficiency of a rack. And when you're trying to put on you know, thousands of dollars worth of inventory and, and thousands of pounds of weight, it's a, a serious risk to consider. Um, invest in a forklift. I like used and finance it if you have to because they can be financed for next to nothing. Um, and also uh, target a, uh, a location that has a heavy warehouse layout as opposed to one that is you know, uh, half office, half warehouse. Because from a rent perspective, if you, talk, if you target a location that is mostly warehouse, your price per square foot is gonna be less than if it was a lot of office space. Um, heating and AC, see what that looks like in the warehouse, in the office, you know, is that something that you're gonna want, do you need, you know, how, what have called the uh, electric company and figure out what those previous, you know, 12 months or six months worth of bills have been, so you can get an idea what the costs have been. A lot of these warehouses, if you want heat, to heat them, it's very, very expensive. Basically ask yourself, does the interior allow your operation to flow effortlessly? For those of you who don't know much about the leases, the differences are mostly between a triple net, NNN or gross, modified gross or industrial gross, they're all the same term. Basically the differences are triple net is you're gonna be paying the rent cost plus your taxes plus your CAM, your uh, facilities maintenance charges. Whereas in a gross lease, all that is included in one lump sum. Uh, leases can run one to 10 years, 10 plus years depending on the space. Larger space typically means a longer lease. Tenant improvements can impact the term or both. 
So if you make a lot of improvements in the space, if you want to change the configuration, if you want to, you know, update a lot of the, the equipment in there or change a lot of electrical configuration, it can impact the rate of the space. It can impact the uh, term of the lease. Um, I kind of listed out there some small and large requests that you normally would find in a warehouse space. Um, but, you know, basically the rule of thumb is the bigger, the more expensive the request, the more likely it is go it's going to be to um, impact the duration of your lease or how much they are going to charge you on the rental rate itself. The biggest thing I can tell you is negotiate. Ask for more and settle for less. People make a mistake and they always go after the rent number on the, on the warehouse space. They go, oh, I'm gonna, I want to get, you know, 20 cents off the rent space. Well, I don't look at it that way. I want to figure out what other pieces of the pie I can shave off from a cost perspective that might be more, more uh, better for me than just saving money on the rent. If I want them to fix the walls, combine spaces, upgrade the electrical or upgrade the appliances or whatever it is, that might cost more than what I'm asking for in this kind of rent. So I'm going to figure out mathematically what those costs are and whatever costs more, that's what I'm going to ask for. So don't necessarily focus yourself on the pure rent cost. Think about what other costs you might have from a pure upgrade perspective on the space itself. Um, test all equipment before you sign. Make sure you, everything is in working condition because once you sign, it's kind of on your, on your, uh, in your ball game to repair or fix if it ends up going, ends up not working. Last but not least, understand your daily cost to operate. This is an important slide that I think all of you should know about. If you have a warehouse space, you obviously know your monthly rental costs and you know your, your fixed costs for you know, uh, utilities like electric, gas, internet, high-speed internet, phone, whatever goes into your, your, your warehouse costs. Um, you know those on a monthly basis. So I put, on, I put down here an example of what my numbers are. My monthly cost is just under $11,000 to operate my space. But I boil that down to a per day cost of $365. That's an important number to know because that's my cost of doing business day in and day out every single day. It's too easy to look at a number and say, oh, I know what my cost is per month, but how much is it costing you every day? Every day, if you're, not, if you're not working, if you're not making any sales, whatever it is, that money is still coming out of your bank account. So you want to look at it from a per day perspective. It's kind of just like you're understanding your P&L and your profit and loss statement for your products that you sell on the, online all the time. I want to thank the Star Labs team and Jeff for having me up today and talking to you guys a little bit about logistics. I will be sticking around for lunch. Of course, if you have more questions, feel free to ping me or um, email me as well. I'm happy to help. Awesome. I won't tell. I won't. I won't. I won't tell that seller who that was because I know who that yeah, was. Yeah, he does know. I saw that on Facebook. I think. Yeah. Um, hang on one second. We have time for like one question. Anybody have a question they want to ask? Yeah. Yeah, I was uh, wondering regarding, so you use Uber Freight, obviously. Do you use other uh, LTL carriers um, like Global Trans or Priority One to get freight quotes as well when you ship into Amazon or not? No, because the, the Uber Freight cost has, has been, you know, for the longest time I thought you couldn't beat Amazon's freight rates. And then Uber Freight came along and I'm like, wow, you can't beat Uber Freight rates. And so far that's whole held true. No one has been able to touch Uber's rates. Plus, I can get them in. To Amazon a lot faster. Awesome. Um, Eddie is going to have a table at lunch, um, just like we had yesterday with a lot of the speakers. So all the speakers today and the sponsors um, will again have tables at lunch today. So if you want to geek out on logistics with Eddie, you can. Um, so hopefully you guys found this valuable. Um, I know that the, the example at the beginning was Eddie walking through my product. Um, that was like the problem I brought to him. And he's like, well, why don't you do this? And why don't you, I'm like, well, yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah, that, wait, that makes sense. Wait a minute, I can order nine months worth of inventory and it's cheaper than ordering it every three months. So um, hopefully the mathematics and the numbers really uh, hit it home as to what the opportunity is. So have Caroline come up and set up the next presentation. Thank you, Eddie, one last time. I'm gonna introduce you to a new, another, another Seller Labs employee, Shay, and she'll introduce our next speaker. Awesome, thanks, Jeff. 
Hi, everybody. I am actually here today. I'm one of the account managers with the Seller Labs Managed Services team. If you haven't, <laughs> like the call out there, guys. Um, if you haven't had an opportunity to talk to one of our team members, definitely find us today. We'd love to talk to you about making your PPC strategy easier. Um, and it's something we get crazy excited about. So don't hesitate to find one of us. Right now, though, right before we break for lunch, we have another great session. I have the ple pleasure of introducing Nathan Hirsch today. Um, Nathan is actually an entrepreneur and an expert in remote uh, hiring and e-commerce. He is the co-founder and CEO of a business that you've probably heard of before, um, freeup.com. Uh, super exciting uh, marketplace that connects businesses with pre-vetted uh, freelancers. So think e-commerce, digital marketing, much more, not just your average virtual assistant. Uh, it goes way beyond that. So he has sold over $30 million online and regularly appears uh, on podca podcasts around the world. He's super excited to be here today, and I know we're super excited to have him. So without further ado, Nathan. Awesome. Thank you. Is this working? Well? Test, test. I think we're good. Cool. Awesome. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you, Seller Labs. Um, I'm the CEO of FreeUp.com, a marketplace for pre-vetted virtual assistants, freelancers, and agencies, which we'll talk about later. But first, who here has hired someone before? And who here has made a bad hire before? Pretty much everyone, right? And the important thing to remember is that no one has a 100% hiring record. What I'm going to try to help you with today is how do we get closer and closer to that 100%? Because the difference between being at that 30 to 40 and the difference between 80 to 90 can be the difference between success and failure in your business. There's a lot of really great entrepreneurs out there with great ideas that just make bad hires over and over and over and they don't have any success. And then there's average entrepreneurs out there that have a so-so idea, but they surround themselves with A players and they keep those A players around and because of that, their business thrives. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. Does this look like you? <laughs> It looks like most entrepreneurs. We wear a lot of different hats, whether it's marketing or, or finance or lead generation, whatever it is. The average entrepreneur is only good at one to three things, but we spend so much of our time doing things outside of our core competency. So I wanna kinda open up your mind a little bit to getting other people to do the things that you're not good at. And one of the first things you have to do is understand what your strengths are. If you don't know what those are, you need to sit down and figure it out. If you have a business partner, which we'll talk a little bit about later, figure out what are you actually good at and how can I get other people that are good at what I'm bad at. Now, there's two ways to run your business. A lot of us have read the, the four-hour work week. You guys read that? So the, the lifestyle business where you're at the beach or maybe you spend more time with your family and you have an outsourced team that's running everything and, and you can spend more time doing all the fun things in life that you want. The other way, which is more like my mentality, where every time I hire someone, and I hire a lot of people, and I get an extra 10 hours in my week, I'm investing then those 10 hours back into my business. I wanna build an empire, I wanna go all out, everything I got. And there's no right or wrong. But either way, either way, you need reliable people that you can depend on. There's very few $1 million a year or $5 million a year entrepreneurs that are solo entrepreneurs. It really just doesn't exist if you think about it. You're going to have to hire people. It's part of your business. And I don't know why entrepreneurs do this, but if, you, if, you had, if you're not good at marketing, you're not just going to say, oh, I'm not going to market anymore. That doesn't make any sense. But for some reason, we do that with hiring. We say, okay, I've made some bad hires. I'm not good at this. I'm just going to do everything myself you're gonna really struggle as an entrepreneur if you do that. So a little bit about me. Uh, I live with my amazing girlfriend, Quinn, my dog, Charlie. No, my girlfriend is not a virtual assistant in the Philippines. She is from Vietnam. I met her long before free up, common mistake. <laughs> and I have an amazing team. They are 50 people, all my day-to-day -day operations, my Skype, my email, all handled by virtual assistants in the Philippines, people I got on my own platform. All my higher level stuff, the Facebook ads, the blogs, all handled by freelancers and agencies on my own platform that I'm just one of their many clients. 
So I really practice what I preach. I know you can build a team entirely remote. We have no office, we have no employees, everything is remote. But it wasn't always that way. I didn't always have my life outsourced. As you can tell, I used to have a lot more hair. <laughs> and back in the day, I was a, a broke college kid, and I wanted extra money. And I, I really knew I didn't want to work for other people. So I kind of looked at college as a, a ticking clock. I had four years to create my own business, or I was going to go into the real world and never look back and be miserable for the rest of my life. So I started hustling and buying and reselling textbooks, created a little referral program, and before I knew it, I had lines out the door of people trying to buy my books to the point where I got a cease and desist letter from my college telling me to knock it off. So I pivoted a little bit. I had heard of Amazon, this was back in 2008. No one knew what Amazon was, no one knew what it was gonna be become, and I started experimenting with really cool products that I was into, like outdoor sporting equipment, um, video games, computer games, typical college guy stuff. And I just failed over and over and over. And it wasn't until I branched out of my comfort zone and found the baby product industry that my business took off. So if you can imagine me as a 20-year-old single college guy selling millions of dollars of baby products on Amazon, that was me. And I'm making this money. I thought, okay, I should probably start paying taxes, right? So I met with an accountant. <laughs> And the first question he asked me was, when are you going to hire your first person? And I kind of shrugged him off, like, why would I do that? That's money out of my pocket. They're going to steal my ideas. They're going to hurt my business. I'm going to have to train them. And he just laughed in my face. And he said, you're going to learn this lesson on your own. So sure enough, my first busy season comes around, the fourth quarter. And I don't know what busy season is with Amazon. There's no courses. There's no gurus. And I just get destroyed. I'm working 20 hours a day. My grades plummet, my social life is gone, and I somehow make it through to January, and I think to myself, man, I can never let that happen again. I need to start hiring people. So what do I know about hiring people? I post a job on Facebook. This guy in my business law class says, I don't know what you do, I need a job. I say, you're hired. <laughs> Ends up being an amazing hire. He's my business partner, Connor. He's up there. He's my business partner for my Amazon business for free up. Worked hard right from the beginning brought a lot to the table. So there I am, this punk 20-year-old kid thinking, man, this hiring thing is easy. You post a job on Facebook, someone shows up, you make more money, your life becomes easier. I got this down. And I just proceed to make bad hire after bad hire after bad hire. And everything I learned from all those bad hires is what I'm gonna teach you today. Obviously, that led me to free up um, down the line. It was tough to hire people in person being 2021, so I turned to the remote hiring world. Well, let's talk about the gig economy a little bit. So if you go back 20 years ago, you had to hire people in your town or the towns next to you. You're pretty limited, and you're competing with all those businesses for the same talent. Fast forward today, not only can you start a business with your laptop and some internet and a little bit of money, but you have access to people from all over the world. And you just get a ton of flexibility. You don't have to hire people full time. You can hire people part time, project based, fixed prices, you can get a virtual assistant in the Philippines. You can hire a marketing agency, so it's one less thing you, you have to deal with. You have a ton of flexibility as an entrepreneur. And whether you like it or not, we're going in that direction. Over the next 10 years, they predict over 50% of the workforce is going to be remote. So if you're not taking advantage of it, your competitors are, one way or another. So I encourage you to open up your mind to hiring remote. It gives you a ton of flexibility as a business owner. Now, before we jump in to what we're going to be going over today, I, the question I get asked 30 times a week is all about risk, right? What are the risks of hiring people remote? So this is my stance on risk. There's always going to be a risk. There's nothing that me or anyone else can do to make that risk zero. Even if you hire your best friend to sit right next to you and you look over their shoulder every single day, there's always a chance they do something stupid or jeopardize your business in some way. Now, with that said, the average virtual assistant, the average freelancer, especially on our platform where it's hard to get in, cares a lot more about getting, making more money, providing for their family, growing their freelance business, than they do about jeopardizing your business in any way. Now, are there things you can do to protect yourself, like user permissions on Amazon, and LastPass, and 
maybe an NDA, although are you really gonna chase someone across the Philippines o over a piece of paper? Probably not. But the number one way to really protect your business is to build relationships with the people that you hire. There's no substitute for that. I've had people I fired, I've had people that have quit on me, they didn't wanna hurt me, I didn't wanna hurt them, and we moved past it. So I encourage you, when you're hiring, if you're worried about risk, first of all, you, you have to get over that risk because hiring is the only way to scale, but focus on building relationships. That is the key to removing or lowering risk when you're hiring people. So what are we gonna do today? We're gonna talk about where businesses mess up. I'm gonna go through a few of the common mistakes because I only have 30 minutes. If you want the rest of them, we have a, a blog article or an ebook called The 10 Common Most Mistakes of Outsourcing. We'll go through some big ones. And then I'm gonna go through my proven five-step hiring process. You can take it, you can steal it, you can tweak it, you can make it your own, but this is what's worked for me. It's the same process that I put all my virtual assistants through, all my freelance, freelancers to make sure that I'm getting the highest possible percentage of making a good hire. So where businesses mess up? Mistake number one, hiring cheap. Now, we've all heard the phrase, you get what you pay for, but I wanna open up your mind to a little bit more than that. There is a time and a place to hire cheap. I have a lead generation process. I've been doing it for five years, I'm happy to send it to you, shoot me an email, message me on Facebook, but I know this process works. I am not gonna spend a lot of money for a virtual assistant to go through this process. It takes about 45 minutes for someone to get onboarded, and if they quit on me, which doesn't really happen, but if they did, it's not that big of a deal. I would get someone else, I would put them in that same process, so that's an area where I'm gonna save money, I'm gonna take the money I'm gonna spend on hiring, and I'm gonna invest it in different parts of my business. Now, my customer service reps that monitor my Skype and email that I've put months and months and months of training into, I'm not gonna go cheap on that because turnover is expensive. Turnover kills businesses. If you look at the success and failure of a lot of startups, it's how big was their turnover. That can really be the difference. So if someone wants 20 bucks an hour, don't lowball them at 15 because they might need a job right then and there. They might take that job at 15 or, or whatever it is, but they feel like they're worth 20. So the second they get a job at 20, they're out the door and it's not the money you lose, you can always make more money, it's the time that you don't get back. The time is the asset. The other story that, that I'll share before going on to the next one is, I have a friend who's an accountant, and he worked for this same accounting firm for six months, or six years, sorry, and he wanted a raise, and he asked for $5,000. Keep in mind, it's a huge firm, and they turned him down. So what did he do? He went out and got another job. And do you think it cost that accounting firm more than $5,000 to replace someone who had been in the company for six years? Yeah. So these are all things to keep in mind. Treat hiring as an investment. How much time have you actually invested in someone? What's gonna happen if that person leaves the company? And how much is that turnover going to hurt your business? That's what you need to be focused on when you're hiring cheap. The mistake I see all the time, mistake number two, is vague due dates and estimates. Whenever you work with a freelancer, and this is more on the freelancer and agency side of it, make sure you get everything in writing. Don't have a phone call with someone that turns into a he said, she said down the line. Set a due date, and not just to do time, because keep in mind, people are in different time zones. It's not due next Tuesday, it's due next Tuesday at 2 p.m. Eastern time. Black or white, if it's 201 and the project is not done, it's late. And I have a policy, I don't work with people that miss due dates. Now, here and there, whatever, it happens. But if someone's constantly missing due dates, I can't work with that person. Keep in mind, when you're dealing with creative freelancers, whether it's graphic design or video, whatever it is, you have to allow time for revisions. You have to allow time for ideas. There's times where I'll go to someone and say, hey, I didn't think of this before, let's add that in. And that might extend the due date. So I always like to say the freelancer sets the due date, not the client. So what I mean by that is I'll say, hey, can you get this done by next Wednesday? But I'll have them confirm that they can actually get it done by next Wednesday. And I set the mentality that I would much rather they tell me they need till Friday than to tell me Wednesday just to make me happy but not be able to do it. Getting people that you work with in that mentality that they have to hit deadlines is a great <laughs> expectation to set right from the beginning. 
Now, if any of you run an agency, put a gap between when it's due for your clients to when it's due with the freelancer. If it's due on your client on Friday, have it due to the, from the freelancer on Wednesday. Allow time for revisions, emergencies. The last thing you want to be, be is left stranded with your client at the last minute. Mistake number three is lots of work without testing. Uh, I think I was just talking to Eric about that before. If you hire someone to do 50 listings, have them do one. Give them feedback. Have them do another. Give them more feedback. Once you've built a relationship with someone and you know what their work ethic is like, then you can give them bigger and bigger projects. But the other thing you have to keep in mind is that freelancers work with a lot of different clients by definition. And what's good for one client might not be good for another. So make sure that you're breaking stuff down into smaller and smaller projects. Protect your investment. Don't give someone a two month project you've never worked with before and then check in with them in two months. You're gonna be surprised with what you get. It might be what's great for someone else. Break stuff down, give feedback, and give them a chance to actually prove themselves before you commit to bigger and bigger projects. Mistake number four, which is a personal mistake that I made, Back in the day, I had a genius idea to hire a manager of the day. I was stressed out of my mind, I wasn't sleeping well, and I thought, man, if I could just train one person to do every part of my business, my life will be easier. So I spent six months, I teach them customer service, listing products, repricing, there was no software back then, so we were manually repricing every listing, and at the end, it was awesome. I was sleeping better at night, my business just ran completely without me, and on the flip side, I did the exact same thing with a supplier. I had this one supplier who was doing about 85% of my business. I said, I don't need that other 15%, let's just focus on this supplier and let's maximize them. So I have my business on autopilot. I am on the top of the world, I got this one supplier who's crushing it, I got this one person who's running every part of my business, and I thought, man, I need to take a vacation. I haven't taken a vacation in a while. So I go to Myrtle Beach and I will never go back. <laughs> On the first day of my vacation, I get three phone calls. The first call from my manager of the day telling me he was quitting on me. The second from my supplier telling me they were dropping me. And then the third from my accountant telling me someone had filed a fake tax return in my name, stolen $40,000 for the government, and I was gonna have to deal with that when I came back. So I go from I'm on top of the world to let's start all over again from scratch. And it was devastating. But I learned a very valuable lesson about diversification. And when I came back, I started contacting lots of suppliers. And I eventually built my lead generation process and worked with over 200 suppliers. And when I came back to hiring and I got to the point where I could hire again, I departmentalized one team for customer service, one person for listing, one person for repricing. And if that person quit, it wasn't as big of a deal. You just plug and play. And a lot of entrepreneurs fall into that trap because hiring is hard. You make a bunch of bad hires, so you find someone you like, and what do you do? You just load that person up with everything. It's incredibly risky. Short term, it might be okay. Long term, it can really hurt your business and it can set you back months. So like I said, I only have time to go through four of the mistakes. I have 10 big ones. You can get, at, get our ebook um, right on the free up website, but I wanna make sure we have time for my five step hiring process. So before we jump into that, for years, people would ask me, how do, you, how do I decide what the best time to hire is? Or who that first hire should be? And I'm not a business coach. For me to talk to someone on the phone for 20 minutes and be like, you need to hire this person right now, doesn't make a lot of sense to me. People didn't really like that answer, so I kind of took a step back and I said, how do I decide when the right time to hire is? And what I do is I look at the numbers. I go and I say, how much money did I make last month and how aggressive do I want to be? If I want to be really aggressive, I'm going to invest 40 to 60% of my profits back into my business, into hiring people. If I want to be more conservative and we're all in a different place in our business and our life, have different bills and obligations, responsibilities, maybe it's 10 to 30%. But figure out what that number is, and you can adjust it month over month. If you wanna go up 10% or down 10%, that's fine too. But the last thing you wanna do is invest time into hiring someone only to realize that you can't afford it or you're investing more than you want to. So let's say that you decide 
you want to invest 25% of your profits into hiring someone. The next question in step one becomes, what are you going to hire for? So what I like to say is create two lists. The first list, get away from your business. Turn off your phone. I don't have my phone on me. I'm freaking out a little bit. And sit by a lake and say, what do I do every day? How are those tasks broken down? Create a list of everything you do on a day-to-day, week-to-week basis. And put a number value next to those things. Is it a $5 an hour task? Is it a $20 an hour task? And understand what your value is. If you're starting a new business, your hourly rate might not be that high. If you're three years in, it might be $1,000 an hour. But figure out what those tasks are and prioritize them from easiest to hardest. And if you've never outsourced before, if you've never hired a VA before, the top of the list is a great place to start. You'll learn a lot of lessons. You'll take some small tasks on your, off your plate. And it's all about how do you get more hours back. What would you do with an extra five hours, 10 hours in a week? So that's list one. List two, and one of the best business activities my partner and I did back in the day, is we sat down on our porch, and for an hour and a half we said, you're bad at this. <laughs> and we just pointed the other person. And we wrote it all down. And it hurt a little bit, it hit us in, the, in our gut. But at the end, we had this list of things we weren't good at, and we realized we complemented each other very well. We were good business partners, that's great. But we also had all these things that neither of us were good at, but we were doing them every single week. So for that list, you're gonna hire specialists and experts or agencies to take those things that you're not good at, take those weaknesses, and turn them into strengths. So that's the two lists. That everything you do, that you have a process for, everything that you're not good at. Step two is you're gonna define what that perfect hire looks like. Is it an employee that sits in your office? Is it a virtual assistant in the Philippines? Is it a US freelancer? Is it part-time? Is it full-time? Is it project-based? What types of skills, what types of background do they have to have? What's the price point that you can actually afford? And then my favorite, what kind of people do you actually work well with? I tend to talk fast, I tend to be pretty direct, I pretty much remove emotions from business in every way. If someone is warm and fuzzy and, and they work slow and they can't handle me being direct, they're probably not the best fit to work with me, even if they check every other box. So understand what you're looking for and the type of people that you work well with is really important for step two. If you don't know what you're looking for, it's gonna be really tough to find it. Step three is the interview. Yes, figure out what platform, use free up, use whatever platform you want, but when you get someone, you gotta figure out how to interview them. Now, a while ago, I used to hire people just for skill. They would have a great resume, they'd have years of experience, and then three months later, it would blow up in my face, and I was there wondering why. How could this person that was so talented be such a bad hire? And I realized that skill was just one part of the equation. They need to have the attitude and the communication as well. For skill, and this is the same vetting we put people through on the free up platform, they have to have, it doesn't matter if they're a 10 out of 10, a five out of 10, a three out of 10 when it comes to skill, what matters is that they're honest about what they can and cannot do, and they're priced accordingly. For attitude, we want people who are passionate about what they do. Who here hates bookkeeping? Me too. <laughs> if I hire a bookkeeper, they need to love bookkeeping as much as I love being an entrepreneur. Those are the type of people that I wanna work with. They can't get aggressive the second that something doesn't go their way. They can't, they have to be able to take feedback without taking it personally. Attitude is important. And last is communication, because it doesn't matter what their attitude is, what their skill is. If they can't communicate with you at a high level, nothing else matters. And we have 15 pages of communication best practices that they have to memorize and get tested on before they get onto our platform. So let's say you use us and we vetted them and you're welcome to vet them yourself. Focus on are they the best fit for me? Because again, even the best virtual assistants, the best freelancer in the world, are not the best fit for every single client in the world. Step four, and the part that everyone messes up, is setting expectations. You make a hire, you get them rolling, and you don't take a second to get right on the same page right from the beginning. We have a free client expectations doc. You can fill it out, you can hand it to them, you can ask them if they have any questions. 
I'll even scare them a little bit. And scare probably isn't the right word, but I would much rather that they, that they back out right from the beginning than for them to work with me for three months and then tell me, oh, I can't live up to, to what you want. So spend that extra time to set those expectations, clear and direct, black and white, in writing. It's going to save you hours and hours and hours of time down the line. And step five is my personal favorite, the feedback loop. So back in the day when I did Office, which was one of the worst business decisions I ever made, I had 50% turnover. I had the same person for the, the same position, three different people, quit on me. And so I got frustrated, I was pissed off, and I sat down with the, the last person that had quit, and I said, hey, can you do an exit interview with me? Now, there's only one type of exit interview, and that's an incredibly uncomfortable one. You're sitting across the table from someone, you're pissed off at them, they're pissed off at you, and I said, tell me, tell me why you quit, tell me what's wrong. And he just hit me to the core. He told me everything that was wrong with my hiring process, my culture, my management style, my leadership, the people in the company, my business model, and I should have written that guy a check right there. Because that information helped me turn my turnover to less than 5% now and really turn my whole business around. And at the end of that meeting, and this always sticks with me to this day, he said, you know what, Nate, in the three, four months, whatever it was that, that, you work, that I worked with you, this was the only time you ever asked me for my feedback. Pretty powerful, right? So the feedback loop is incredibly important. You want to give them feedback on whether they're meeting your expectations from step four, but you, it has to go the other way too. You have to create a culture and an environment that whether they're a virtual assistant in the Philippines or they're a graph designer you're using for one project, that they can give feedback on you, on your communication, on your management, on your business, because as you get bigger and bigger, you get farther and farther removed from what's working and not working in the middle of your business. That feedback is important. So that's my presentation today. I know I went a little fast, tried to keep it under 30 minutes. Five-step hiring process, some mistakes. Here are some of the stuff you can get on the free up platform. We have over 100 skill sets, virtual assistants, freelancers, agencies from all over the world, from followers to doers to high-level experts. You guys finished taking pictures there. You can check out my podcast called The Outsourcing and Scaling Show. Um, if you go to freeup.com slash seller labs, you get a free $50 credit to try us out. If, you've already, if you're already a client using FreeUp, you get 5% off your next hire. Just mention Resonate. Um, you can connect with me. I'm probably one of the easiest people to contact on social media, email, whatever it is. And yeah, how'd I do on time? Awesome. Perfect. Thanks, Nathan. Thanks.